Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you were in this track yesterday, you'll have seen me because I was doing the MC job. Uh, if you were, this is a different t-shirt. looks the same, but actually is different. My name's Elton. I work for Docker. I'm an advocate. Uh, I go around talking about Docker. Uh, I'm a huge fan. That's why I joined Docker. And it's a pleasure to be here with Jeff, who's a captain. I'm a captain. Um, I'm an author. wrote Docker in Action. I run my own independent consulting firm, help people move to Docker, move to the cloud, adopt microservices, review, review system architecture. So a little bit of everything, but it's an honor to be here. Absolutely. So um, we're going to be talking a lot about image to Docker. And there are, there are two image to Dockers. There's image to Docker for Linux and Windows. But rather than just kind of dryly show you how it all works, we framed it into a, into a realistic problem, uh, which actually is, is something that, that you, you see all the time. So the problem we've got is we've got an application with several components, and one of them is Linux-based. Some of them are Linux-based. Some of them are Windows-based, and they all run in different VMs. And so, if you want to be, if you're a, a mythical full-stack developer, you need to have a whole bunch of different VMs running because if you're going to do the front-end work, which happens to be React, then that's hosted on an Apache Linux machine in production. So really, you want your dev environment and your test environment to be as close as possible to that. If you're writing the REST API, which is the back end, that's in .NET, full .NET framework. So you're going to have to have an IIS web host for that, the web server, and you're going to need a Windows machine to run it on. So the problem is uh, we've got two completely different sets of stacks, top to bottom. So the, the application stack, the operating system, uh, everything is completely different and two different worlds. And they're and in very different vir virtual machines. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. And when you've got them in virtual machines, like that's OK, but uh, if you're a Linux guy, you don't want someone giving you a 60 gigabyte Windows VM <laughs> so you can spin up the back end. And if you're a Windows guy, you don't want someone giving you a 5 gig Linux VM because you've got no idea what to do with it. You turn it on and you're like, well, why is this thing flashing? Where do I click next? Or even worse, you hand it off to a third party, somebody else, a product manager who has no idea how to use any of them, <laughs> and, but, but they've got to do something with them. Absolutely. So this is a problem you see all the time. So uh, the demo app we've got is actually a, a cut of the demo app that you saw in the keynote the, yesterday, the, the, the art store application. And we did actually have some of these problems as we were building it, because I'm building the back end in .NET. That's, my, that's the world I come from. Uh, and the guys who are building the front end are, are Mac developers and all in React. So actually, some of the problems I'm going to show you uh, are real. And this is, this is the state that we're in. So we've been dropped into this dystopian hellscape of mixed mode virtual machines, and it's a really, really dirty job. And we talk to a lot of people, a lot of consultants who are actually living this stuff day to day, and we kind of came to the conclusion that we needed a dirty hero to, uh, <laughs> to get us out of this situation. And so we decided to pick up a lift and shift style solution. So. Should we solve it like this? Um, when I found out that we were going to do a lift and shift, um, I went looking for successful lift and shift projects, and I don't think I saw any. Still looking. Still looking. Um, there, there, there are some that are very, very niche. There are some that have broad adoption among very specific use cases. Um, and really, they're all kind of rough for several different reasons. And, and whenever I talk about this to people, the first thing hopefully, that, it, that uh, existing Docker users say, well, wouldn't it be just easier to learn Docker? Wouldn't it be easier to learn how to actually just containerize your application in the first place? And I mean, I would say yes uh, in, in a lot of cases, but there really are a lot of cases where people need to, um, to rapidly experiment, and they already have a virtual machine disk, and they just, they just want to get it done. And, and, and you know, they, they're not necessarily concerned with best practices because the lift and shift process, it doesn't even know really what it's lifting and shifting. Um, and so it's very difficult to apply best practices when you have no idea what practices are appropriate to apply, right? And so, you know, what are the use cases? Rapid prototyping is, is the, the rapid prototyping on migration is the strongest use case. It's the use case that helped drive our initial targets for lift and shift. Um, and, you know, we, we've used it successfully, so. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we, 
we've kind of looked at it as so we've been doing this we as docker uh, doing this with clients and we treat it as a starter for 10. so particularly on the windows world you, you'll see as we go through the demonstration uh, the windows world has its own set of challenges but um some some parts are, are much easier to find so you can you can run this tool over uh, over an asp.net website and most asp.net websites look the same um but the uh, the, the the problem that we've got is um that the tool itself uh, needs to have it's either highly opinionated or it needs to be to deal with a huge amount of fragmentation. So the, the choices we've made when we started building these tools is that they are two completely separate tools. They, they're, they're from the same family. They're called Image to Docker, but that's the surname, right? Because actually they're totally different beings. They're both targeted to the audience. So the Windows tool is a PowerShell module. So Windows admins are or should be familiar with PowerShell, and the way you run it, you just run a PowerShell module. There's a, in the Windows world, there's a, there's a public gallery where you can put your modules, so to install it, you literally just write install module image to Docker, nice and easy. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Linux world, there's, it's, it's a Go application, and it uses Docker, yep. which, is, which makes perfect sense in the, in the Linux world, it makes no sense in the Windows world, because in Windows, to use Docker, you've got to be on Windows 2016, and you're probably not. But Windows 2016 is, is your goal to run your images. You don't want to have to do that first to, to run the tool. So they're targeted for the audience. They're both open source, and they're, they're meant to be extensible. They're componentized. They, they, they have to be extensible. They have to be Because extensible. there's no way that the two of us could anticipate every single use case out there, and I don't want to. We, we really don't want to presume anything about what, what people are lifting and shifting, because especially in the Linux world, it's funky out there, right? Uh, like, perhaps there's no way. So, uh, so we decided to lift and shift through here, like, okay, what are the challenges here? And even with a successful project, what are the challenges for using it? Um, security is my biggest number one issue. Whenever you have a disk at rest that you're lifting material out of and putting into a Docker container, you're running a real risk of leaking secrets, leaking any key material at rest uh, secure environment variables, if there's such a thing. Um, all of that stuff, weird identities, password files, you name it, you can potentially leak it, right? And so we wanted to be very specific and say, hey, look, we need to make sure that the provisioners, or th that the things that are doing the lifting and shifting are careful about what they're, what they're getting, but at the same time, we also wanna make sure that, you know, that the users, are aware that they could do this, that they could leak their secret material. So it's very, it's a, it's a sketchy proposal to say, oh, I'm just gonna lift and shift this and then push it to Docker Hub, because unless you're very careful, you might accidentally leak your private keys or your password files or your whatever, uh, and now you've got a real problem. The second thing is the actual content. Do we actually need to lift and shift everything? There's some projects that lift and shift like one specific component. Um, there's other projects that are way more ambitious that say we want to lift and shift everything. Um, at least, in the, and, and we kind of took the stance that we have components. You can bring them in and they will lift and shift target things. Um, and I wanted it to very specifically be as easy as possible to write an extension and, and not need to know the framework in order to do that. And that's been one of the hardest problems um, for other projects is that you actually have to know the project in order to write an extension for it. In this case, we're just using Docker images. You can bring your own tooling, you can do whatever you want. Um, the next problem kind of goes into the, the, the previous two. You have a configuration explosion, especially in the Linux world where you can deploy Apache in an infinite number of ways and detecting an infinite number of Apache installations um, it is not feasible. So. And there's a, there's a counterpart in the Windows world. So even though the Windows world, the, the ecosystem is a bit more closed. <laughs> so if you're running a website in Windows, you're probably running on IIS because that's that's Microsoft's web server. Um, so we can we can be a bit more narrow in our in our tool. And if you want to pull a website from a VM, we know where to look. But the trouble is, although we don't have the config explosion, we have we have a longevity explosion. So with Windows, you could be people are running Windows Server 2003 for their production workloads. And that that's old. And that works in a totally different way from the, from the newer stuff. So um, even in the Windows world, we've still got to deal with that. That How do we find out where this stuff is in order to analyze it to pull it out? Right. And then on top of it, the very last thing is, okay, the tool can lift and shift the material that it finds, but 
the tool has really, it, it's very difficult to communicate success criteria. How can the tool actually validate that it succeeded in lifting and shifting everything that it needs to do? Um, and that's hard. So at the end of the day, people are still gonna have to say, okay, I've got a Docker image, now does it work? Does it do exactly what I expect to? Um, because remember, a container is just a process. You don't have a full kernel, you don't have an, a full-blown init system um, that you would have when you're booting a virtual machine. There's a lot of different semantics that are going on. And so I think we've, done, we've struck a good, a, a good compromise in figuring out sensible defaults. Um, but again, everything in these projects is extensible and replaceable, batteries included sort of mentality. So. Absolutely. So, so those are all the disclaimers, right, for the demos that we're about to show you. So these tools are live, They're out, they've been out for a while, been used, um, and the, the, the use case we're gonna show you, you can just put the tools on the VMs, pull out the, the Docker files, and, and be ready to go, because we've got a, a fairly uh, simple setup. And you can take this and run it on your own VMs, and your mileage will vary. <laughs> so this is how the tools actually work. So, they both have slightly different terminology, but they do the same things. So the Linux version, uh, it's targeted at the moment for various Linux distros, so we can understand what distro you're running on, and it will mirror that in the, in the Docker file that it produces. Uh, it understands certain web servers, so Apache and... Right today, today we targeted LAMP. Yeah. We were saying, hey, what's a good low, or what's a good low hanging fruit to target? And LAMP stack is still very, very common, especially among uh, you know, VM style deployments. Yeah. So we thought that that was a good first, first yeah. shot. And there are, even within that LAMP stack, there are a million billion variations. So uh, there's, we, we've yeah, caught some of them. At least. Uh, and similarly with the Windows stack. So uh, again, the, the variations are smaller, but we still wanted to be focused on the majority of workloads. And ASP.NET uh, workload is running on IIS. There are, there are millions. So those are what the tools can do, and the way they do it is the same in both cases. There's a discovery phase where they go and look for stuff on the VM, and that could be a running VM or it could be a disk image, uh, and they, they look in specific places in the components that understand where to look. And when they find it, they extract it, and then they're ready to provision that into, into the, the final Docker image. So what you get from both of these tools is the output is a Docker file with a bunch of folders underneath it to generate the content for a Docker build. It doesn't build the image for you because it lets you look at what's come out and then you can control the actual, the actual generation. And this is, the, this is the demo app we're gonna show you. So we've got, um, uh, we're not doing a full LAMP stack, so on our, on our Linux side, we've got a React front end running on Apache, and that talks to a .NET REST API, which is running on Windows, obviously, and that talks to SQL Server running on Windows. And this is the position we were in at the start. So in order to work on this, if you're gonna work on the whole thing, or if you want to set up a test environment that's got the whole stack, you need two VMs, two operating systems, you need two of everything, and basically you need two people. You need me and Jeff or people of you know, similarly high quality. Very hard to find, very hard to find. And this is where we want to get to. We just want a bunch of containers. We just want to look at containers. We want to, we want to deal with uh, distributing our software with images without caring what's inside. We want to deal with packaging our software into images, and we want to deal with running it as containers. And that's, that's what we want to do. And that's what we're going to do. That's the goal. Yeah. So we're about 10 minutes in, so let's have an agenda. So first, this falls into two parts. So firstly, we're gonna show you really briefly uh, one of the problems that you get into when you're in this state. And then we're gonna show you the tools, image to Docker for Windows, image to Docker for Linux. And then uh, when, we, when we've shown you the tools, we will have two images. We'll have an image with our Apache stuff in and an image with our .NET API in. And then we're gonna deploy it into a hybrid swarm and we're gonna like see if it works. Sure, let's do it. Okay. So, I need to push this button. Nope. No? Nope. I think for this one, because it's on this machine, right? No, it's on this one. Oh, sorry, on that was one? too, yeah. There we are. Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is a, a, a day in the life of building this app, and this actually happened while I was helping to build the demo app for the keynote. So I'm the .NET developer, this is my REST API. Don't worry about what's going on here, because if you're not familiar with it, you don't need to be. Um, 
one of the things we did is uh, a first cut of the API, we sent the images back as a, as a binary blob, as a, as a, a, a six, base64 blob, and then the front end rendered it. And then partway through, we said, well, this, this sucks. We should be sending a URL and the content should live in the front end. So we made that change. And right now I'm halfway through that change. So I've just made the changes I want to do. I'm gonna spin it up in uh, Visual Studio. And because it's a, it's a back end tool, uh, mostly I, I don't, I'm not gonna look at the UI much because, <laughs> Who cares about you guys, right? So I'm going to look at my REST API. And for that, I use a tool called Postman. If you never used it, you need to use it if you're doing REST stuff. I've got some really basic uh, endpoints here that just prove things are working. So I've got an endpoint that will get me the host name. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a health check, which will, which will ping the SQL Server database and just do a get date to make sure that that connection's in place. And then I've got the real API, which gets me a list of products. And these products are the uh, the art store product. So here we've got a picture of Moby and it tells me, so I'm halfway through this change and my image now is a URL that the front end should, should have the content for. But if I go to my front end, that ain't right. And if you'd shown that in the keynote, I would've got fired. So um, the problem here is the front end is an old version that I've copied onto my Windows machine because I don't want to be running another VM. So I've got an old version of the front end talking to a new version of the API. If I was on the other side and I was uh, building the front end, I'd have some sort of stub for the API that returns static JSON and I'd be in the same position. They're just gonna get out of step, they're gonna get out of date because it's too hard to have the full stack running for you. So that's, that's the position we're in. And now we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna fix that, aren't we? That was pretty smooth to you, I did Yeah, that? yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk about the Linux build first. Um, so we built an app right now, it's called V2C, it's, that's a, an old artifact. Um, but let's, let's actually dive in, so. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. So, we have a project, and we have a VMDK. It's a flat monolithic VMDK right now, um, and we want to move this thing over. And so what I want to do first, if you'll bear with me, is uh, actually show you that this thing lives. We have help test, text. So there's two kind of, well there's three kind of components in what is currently called V2C. This is the Linux lift and shift tool. They're detectives and they're provisioners. Detectives detect and lift, and provisioners take all the output from the detectives and present it for final assembly. Um, this is their chance to actually mutate the content and uh, make whatever changes you need. So I wanna show you a couple of detectives before we actually run a generation. Um, so let's actually look at, we're gonna look at a detective for, uh, do 16.10, how about that? So that's at the bottom of the screen. You can see it. Um, so it's really like one command. Um, so all the detectives have, stat have, have access to the disk at rest. Um, and so you can do anything. You can bring any tools you want to to work with the files on that disk. In this case, all I needed was grep to determine that um, we're running Ubuntu 16.10, or that Ubuntu 16.10 is installed on this disk. Um, it's really straightforward. If you know how to write a Docker file, you can extend this. Um, now let's look at a provisioner for Ubuntu 16.10. Cat at this time. Provisioners. Hmm? Oh, provisioners. I always do that. There's no good whispering when you've got a mic. You yeah, you can't whisper you. at all, man. <laughs> okay, this one's really good. All it's gonna do is actually take a Docker file that's packaged with the, with the image, and it just cats it out on, on the output stream. If you know how to work with input output, like standard in, standard out, you know, you know how to take input from detectives and how to give output right back to the workflow. Very straightforward. Although maybe a little bit foreign considering how infrequently you work with it. Um, but let's look at the Docker file real quick. So provisioners can contribute Docker file fragments. That's it from Ubuntu 16.4. Um, if you're familiar with the from uh, directive, you know that this is gonna have the resulting image is gonna start from 
16.4, we have a typo. Yeah, yeah. That should say 16.10. Uh, feel free to put a PR in. Yeah, in we're looking for, for, for contributors all the time. Um, so we've seen that one. Very, very simple, right? Let's actually take a look at something a little bit more complex. Uh, so this is one of the more complicated provisioners that we've written, or uh, detectives that we've written. Um, I didn't want to bring any extra tools. I just wanted to use Alpine. So in this case, what we're trying to do is I'm reading the actual dpackage uh, database at rest using uh, awk and said, et cetera, to actually pull out a list of packages that should be installed on the resulting operating system. This is not simple, right? But that's, it's, it's what it's doing that's not simple. Interacting with the, with the framework is really simple. You really don't need to know anything other than, hey, how do I get this list? How do I write a test standard out? Um, very straightforward. So, oh, that's cat. So let's actually run a generation. Okay, we've got an empty directory. And I'm going to run a build. Okay, so we have a build command. We're calling out the VDC, saying build, and this is the name of the VMDK that we want to migrate. So we're actually gonna go ahead and do that. And now here it fired up all the detectives, ran through really, really quick. It fired them up in parallel, which is important to know. It fired them up in parallel because I don't know what's inside this thing. And, and then the detectives that detected the situation passed the material off to provisioners. Provisioners ran. And now we have a Docker file and some material. Hooray. Let's take a look at it real quick. So we can see that we're starting from Ubuntu 16.04 because of the typo. Um, no, this was a 1604 image. Was it? Yeah. Okay, this was a 1604 yeah. image. Yeah, 1604. Okay, so we can see here's the list of all those packages that were pulled out from that one detective that is ridiculous. <laughs> um, we can see here real quick that it also detected some Apache 2 configuration in Etsy. Um, it also detected that it inspected the configuration there and determined the document route for Apache 2 was set to var www. Um, and then lifted var www. And so I had mentioned earlier we don't have an init system because containers are processes. Um, but we want to simulate the one. So um, we decided to standardize on run it. Um, and so we're contributing a run it service, um, uh, in a, a run it uh, monitoring service or a supervisor service. Um, and then contributing service scripts specifically for Apache 2. So when we build this thing and start it up, it'll be running all of that as if it were in a virtual machine. So if you had other things in here, like a, pat or like a MySQL or some other process, and it was able to lift and shift that configuration into a run it startup, into a run it service, those would also start up within the container. So you'd actually have your, your fat container, your multi-process container on boot. boot. So, so, that, so this is what, what we were saying about, do we lift and shift everything? We don't know what you need from your VM. Uh, when I show you the, the, the Windows counterpart, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff because the VM has been used for different things. Um, and that's not an optimized Docker file, right? Because we no. can't say whether we can take any of those packages out. I mean, we have some general best practices, right? Because one of the nice things about lift and shift is, is that you aren't really gonna have a whole lot of opportunity for collision because your source material is all the same. So it kind of doesn't matter if multiple things are contributing the same file and they overwrite each other. That's not a big deal. It's not optimal because now you have two layers with redundant files. Yeah. But um, we can make sure to apply certain things in a certain order to make sure that like, the consistency of the data is, is, uh, is right. So I'm gonna kick off a build real quick. And that's gonna fire up and run in the background. Um, but that's going to take a while too, so I'm going to kick it back over to you. And cool. Okay, let's have a look at what we've got on the other side. Which button do I press? So when we first talked about doing this session, like one of the early ideas was, should we have a my image to Docker is better than your image to Docker? <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, no, let's let's be friendly. So we didn't do that. So this is the this is the Windows version now. 
So uh, similarly, we've got, uh, uh, I've already installed the module, so now I'm gonna do a get help, and ours is called convert to Dockerfile, which is, uh, if you're familiar with PowerShell, there are certain, uh, there's a, like a verb noun thing, um, and that tells us what we need to do. So that's cool, so that all works. Similarly with, uh, uh, I'll show you what some of the code looks like, but it's very different structure from, from Jeff's code because, as I said, there are fewer things that we need to that we need to investigate. But when we investigate them, we've got to go a bit deeper. So in this case, this is finding out from uh, IIS, from the web server, uh, all the stuff that's configured. So, so as Jeff said, you know, go to the configuration, find out where your content is. This is how we do it in the PowerShell world. So I know. I've, by the time I've got to this point, I know what version of Windows I'm running, I know what version of IIS I'm running, I know where I need to look. So I go and look at this config file, which is just XML, and then I suck out all the websites and all the bits and pieces that are in there. So very similar, kind of. Uh, and then the way you use it is the same. So on here, I've got, I'm gonna run my convert to Docker file, and I've got uh, an image path, which is where my VM is. As I said before, you can run against a running VM, or you can run against uh, a static uh, disk. And mine's on the E drive, and it's called test server because it's just some test server. I know my apps on there. I don't know what else is on there. Obviously, I do because I built it. But you can get the idea. <laughs> uh, I tell it where I want to put the output, and I'm going to put it in I2D2. So when I first started working on this, I called it I2D2 because I thought it was a pretty cool name, and it never caught on. <laughs> but I still call it I2D2. So output power. All of our names are defunct at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have slightly different naming conventions. So w with the um, Similarly with the, the Linux version, the Windows version can detect various different things, but you can zone down when you, when you, run, uh, when you, run, the when you run the application because if you've got a web server, you, you probably don't also have a SQL server on there. So you can tell it what you want to look at. So I want to look at IIS, which is the, the web server. Uh, I'm going to go verbose so we can see what it's doing. And it does basically the same thing uh, without using Docker because we don't necessarily have Docker on the host. It mounts the virtual machine image or it connects to the running machine. It goes through and runs all those, those detectives that, it, that, it, that understand what they're looking for. So in this case, it knows which version of Windows it is. It finds IIS, it finds ASP.NET. It finds that the old version of .NET isn't on there, which is important because otherwise we'd have to use a different Docker uh, base image. Uh, and then it generates all the stuff that's in there. So if I go into my I2D2, and do an ls, you'll see, similarly, I've got a Docker file, I've got uh, the, the folders that were pulled out, and because I'm not a command line guy, let's go and look at that, uh, that Docker file. It's probably not being a command line guy here. So, here's the directory, there's my Docker file. Similarly, if I switch to this mode, you'll see I've also got a big chunk of stuff uh, that doesn't look great. And the reason for that is because when this machine was set up, it was set up with a whole bunch of defaults. And all these things are flags for configuring bits of IIS in Windows. And I don't know, the tool doesn't know whether you need them or not. So this is your kind of starter for 10. You might look at this and say, well, I don't need that stuff. Well, but that's... I mean, I certainly have no idea if we need it or not. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and yeah, so this is, this is the point where you, you kind of get going. So I'm using Microsoft ASP.NET as the base image. That's cool. Uh, I've got a bit of boilerplate code in there. And then down here, I've got all the websites that were on that VM. And there's a bunch of stuff here, uh, which I don't really want. I only want this one, which is at C, which is the API. But there's other stuff on there because other people have used that machine. But what I can do, rather than delete those files, uh, delete that part of the code, I will run the, the tool again, and uh, I can pass a parameter to the artifact. So I'm still only using IIS, but I'm telling you I only want part of the, of the output to come out. And that's, oh, I need to do the same directory because it won't overwrite it by default. So let's call that at C. And it does all the same stuff again. So it mounts the virtual machine, it checks what version of Windows, it goes and looks for IS, which version of IS, blah, 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 blah. all the same stuff. But at the end, uh, so it still does the same, the same extraction, but at the end, it doesn't build it into the Docker file because I've only, I've only asked for a certain artifact to come out. And we're going to check this out in my at C directory, which is here. I've got another Docker file, which is a lot neater. So I've only got one website in there, which was the thing that I asked it to pull out. Still got all the boilerplate stuff, and it's still got the Microsoft ASP.NET, um, but that's, you know, that's only, I've taken one application out of that. So this is a slightly better way of doing lift and shift. Mm -hmm. I haven't taken the whole VM, I've just taken one part out of it. Okay, and just like before, uh, just as Jeff showed you, if I go into I2D2 at C, and I do a Docker build, I give my tag, at C API, and tell it where to go. 
So I've already built this, so it's super quick. So, but it's just, we're in the world of Docker now. So we both run our tools, but we're both now back in just, this is just Docker. So we're just doing ordinary Docker stuff. Cool. We know how to work with the container. With the container. <laughs> yeah, you would You're hope done. so. <laughs> okay, so let's flip back to this machine. Hey, cool. Okay, so we've had our demos. And the situation we're in now is we've got two images. It's a good spot to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a better spot than having two huge VMs. I've got one huge Windows image, but I've got a much smaller Linux image, and they're both still way smaller than the original VMs. But I can only run that Windows image on a, on a Windows machine running Docker. I can only run the, the Linux image on a Linux machine running Docker. Uh, because if you're not familiar with Windows containers, the implementation is different, but the principles are the same. The, the container runs a process. The process actually runs on the kernel of the host. So in order to run that process, the kernel needs to be able to do something with it. And you can't ask a Linux kernel to, um, to run a Windows process. You don't speak my same language. Exactly. Yeah. But you can build a hybrid swarm. So you can build a swarm and you can join in uh, Linux and Windows. They can each be managers or workers. And then suddenly you're in the world of just having a swarm and you can run whatever containers you want. So we can run our API container on a Windows node and our front end app on a Linux node in the same overlay network and they'll be able to connect together. Right. And then we can go one stage further because actually this is still a pretty basic setup. If we've got a cluster with capacity, we can start moving to a more production-like environment. So we can have something like this. So we've got our generated uh, Docker image from the front end from the Linux VM and the generated image from the back end from the Windows VM. But we can front them with Nginx and that'll run on Linux. That's cool. Uh, and we can have a back end of SQL Server and that can be running on our Windows VM in a container. Which kind of brings us to the big finale. Now it says here that we're gonna do a demo, but I don't think we should because it might go wrong. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Should we just show some slides? Let's just, well, your call. Okay, okay. Well, the, the demo gods have been pretty good so far. They have actually, yeah. But then, you know, it's nearly the end. Okay, right. hashtag courage. Let's right, go for let's it. it. Let's have a straw poll, please. Uh, please raise your hands if you think this will work. That's pretty confident. That's not Whoa. bad, yeah. I thought that room is my next joke. Man, I thought that this was, okay. I was gonna say, I find your life is so disturbing. But there's no point anymore. No, no. Okay, anyway, the joke doesn't matter. So let's go and see if it is actually gonna work. So on my, am I back in my VM? Yeah, cool. So on my Mac, I have got uh, two VMs running. So I've got a Linux VM and a Windows VM. And these are just, they've got nothing on them but Docker. So they're, they're stock uh, uh, Linux and Windows VMs with, with Docker on them. And in my terminal here, I'm connected to, uh, to each of those. So let's go and check this out. Clear this down. Let's try again. Okay, so on the left, on the left in orange, I've connected to my Linux VM. And you can see that from Docker version. My, my client version is running on Darwin on my Mac, and the, the server is running on Linux. On the right hand side, I'm connected to my Windows, and you can see I'm using blue for Windows. Mm. And orange for Linux, awesome, because it is Ubuntu. Maybe, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> and again, same client, and this time I'm talking to a Windows server. Okay, cool, so so far, so good. So on the left-hand side here, I'm gonna do docker swarm init. And you've seen all this before, but this is one command, and suddenly I've got super secure swarm, ready to go. That gives me my token, and then I'm gonna copy that into my Windows machine. Or I would if I'd copied it correctly. Windows machines make good workers. <laughs> and that's it. So now I've got my hybrid swarm, so that's pretty cool. So on the left-hand side here, I can do my node ls, see my, see my machines. I've got my manager, which is on Ubuntu, because that's where I initialized the swarm. I've got my Windows machine that's running as a worker. Now, I need to do one other thing, because uh, I need to, when I run my containers, I need to make sure that Docker runs the Windows one on the Windows machine, and the Linux one on the Windows machine. So I'm gonna do that with constraints, and node labels. So I'm gonna update my label, my node, and I'm gonna add a label here. Label add OS equals Windows. So you could, labels are arbitrary key value pairs. You can have- I think that you want Linux on that one. I haven't finished yet. Okay. So 42S, see, Windows. Ah. And then I'm gonna do OS equals Linux for the Linux one, which is OKF, zero KF. Okay, and that's, like that's it. That's all I need to do to prepare my swarm. It's pretty uh, easy. 
And it's pretty easy. And at some point in the future, you won't need to do that because the engine will understand that the image you've asked to run is a Windows image and it will schedule it on a Windows machine. Okay, so because we're in a swarm, I'm not going to run containers, obviously, I'm going to create services. So I've got a script to do that for me. And I'll show you what that script is, which is super easy. So it just creates an overlay network. So containers on those machines can, can talk to each other. We create a service for the database. So that's my SQL server running on Windows. And that's where I've got my constraint to say it needs to run on Windows. Mm -hmm. I've got my API, that's my .NET API, also running on Windows. I've got the app, which is the front end app, the React app, hosted in Apache, running on Linux. Lifted and shifted with the tool. Lifted and shifted with the tool, yeah. And the API is lifted and shifted with my yeah, tool. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the app has got the Linux constraint. And the proxy, which is Nginx, has got the Linux constraint. And the only thing that I'm exposing is the proxy. So there's no way to get into any of these other containers unless you're a container in this network. So everything is nice and secure. And as we go to production, what we're going to harden is Nginx. And that Nginx config uh, is super simple. All it's got is a location. If I'm asked for an API endpoint, I pass off to the API service. And if I'm asked for a front end endpoint, I pass off to the front end app. Simple. OK. So that's looking good. So if I do a Docker PS on the left, oh, nothing. That isn't good, is it? <laughs> How many people put their hand up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I've got a. Oh, I didn't pull it. That's why. Let's pull that now. There we go. That's going to go and pull that up. So uh, how are you doing, Jeff? Now we're crossing our fingers. Yeah. How's the network been holding up? Yeah, it's all right. All right. Yeah. yeah. You enjoy Docker? You know, it's been pretty good. Yeah. I got a question for the audience, though. How oh, many cool. people have tried a lift and shift tool before? Any lift and shift tool? There's like four or five hands. Of those four or five hands, has anyone actually used it successfully? There's <laughs> like one strong hand and two hand wavy hands. Maybe one other strong hand. So, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it's 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 a rough proposition, right? Um, I really did put quite a bit of effort into looking for them, and they're they are out there. Um, but I mean, I, I just never got a a Docker quality experience out of, out of any of them, or really even any like simple first sort of touchy feely. Like they were tools that that were about being tools. They were about the tool, right? Like you had to learn the tool, like a lot about the tool before you could use it. Yeah. So um, they, they're super opinionated because they want you to work their way. Right. They don't right. have that. that. Um, and that was the exact opposite of what we tr wanted to try to build here. We wanted something that that felt like a force multiplier. Absolutely. So here we go. So I'm running the services again. Now I've got the image. Now everything will be fine, won't it, Jeff? <laughs> cool. That's good. So now we get in there. OK. Oh, just right Docker doesn't help. Cool. OK, so on the left, on my Linux machine, I've now got the, uh, the app running. And I've got the proxy running. The proxy wouldn't start unless it could reach the app and the API, because that's what Nginx does. And on the Windows machine, I've got my API, and I've got my database. And so I should be able to go and, and ping the endpoint now and go and see it. So to show there's no trickery, it would be much easier if we'd just done trickery, wouldn't it? I mean, maybe a little bit. <laughs> so info, this is, the, this is the, the Linux VM address. So that's where I'm going to go. And that's going to that's be picked up by Nginx. So Nginx is then going to reroute the rest of the traffic. And what we're going to see is the front end here. And don't be alarmed. So what's happening now is because we've taken that, that Docker file, so what's happened now is the, the API is warming up. So when you first start a Windows uh, machine that's running, there we are, that's running IIS, it takes a while to warm up. So the first thing you'll do with that generated Docker file, when you start to, to you get rid of a big chunk of stuff that you don't need, then you'll put a health check in and that will do the warm up for you. But if you're brave, like we are, we didn't do that. We just, these are the Docker images that the tools built for us. And that's our, that's our Nginx front end running on Linux in the swarm. And we've got our REST API running on Windows in the Swarm. Yep. We've got SQL Server running on Windows in the Swarm. And we've got our Apache running on Windows in the Swarm. And if this was a keynote, they would all be clapping and cheering. I would hope, I would hope yeah. so. I quite like this whispering thing. I don't usually do that. I might do yeah. more of that. OK, so 
very quickly wrap up and then we'll, we'll throw open for a few questions. Um, so, yeah, I've done most of the talking, so you have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really, uh, like I want to hammer home that we wanted to hit simplicity and, and Docker style, like ease of extensibility um, first and foremost, um, because this is really rough. Um, and, and, and what we would love in order to make these real tools is community contribution, because again, there's two of us here, and you know, like the, the, the combinatorial explosion off of potential configurations, especially for the Linux side, is, is insane. Um, and so we can only go so far. Um, so if you come up with a good extension or a specific thing that you're lifting and shifting, feel free to contribute it back. You don't actually even have to contribute it here in the case of the Linux side. You can just push a Docker image. Um, anywhere. You can run the Docker image locally. There's a really simple taxonomy. We, we identify detectives and provisioners and packagers using labels. Um, and so there's a rich metadata around it. Um, and that's really it. Um, but again, you know, pick it up and play with it and, and give it a shot. And I, I had some guy tweet me uh, the Docker file that was generated when he pointed image to Docker for Windows to a SharePoint server. And everybody was like, <laughs> was like whoa, what the fair play, dude? At least it ran. Um, so yeah, so we've shown you the tools. Yep. We've kind of had that caveat around the fact that this, this will generate you a Docker file that will build into an image, but that ain't necessarily what you're gonna go to production with. Right. Uh, but we've shown you then that with these two tools, if you've got mixed workloads, you can run them in a, in a hybrid swarm. If you wanna try something out, if you, if you want to see what something that is currently a virtual machine looks like in a, in a container before you go, give it a shot. Um, really keep in mind that you should make sure that you're not lifting and shifting private key material <laughs> or password files, et cetera. It's very risky. Um, but with Thanks. that in mind, like have fun with it. Yeah. So, those, so we've got some, some fancy short links. So Dockerly, i to d Linux, and i to d Win, to, to, to go, that will take you to, to GitHub. Uh, you should definitely follow Jeff and me on Twitter. Because yeah. like, like why not? We're yeah. pretty active Twitter yeah. users. So. Absolutely. And we, we obviously know a load of stuff. Um, and we're done. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Want to do questions? Do you want to do questions? Have we got time for questions? Yeah, we have time for questions. Uh, right now, we have a break uh, starting now. But since there's no talk until after the break, if you want to stay to ask questions, please do. I think this, great was, this, this talk was absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to start us off with a short question. Thanks. Uh, so Elton, I noticed that you ran your uh, lift and shift tool on a running or you said you could run it on a running VM. I'm wondering if the same is true for the Linux tool. Yeah. Yes. So the way the Linux tool works is um, because it's Docker, we share file systems via volumes. And so the, the, the one component that I didn't demo because it's really, there, there's only one right now, is called a packager. Um, in this case, I use Guestfish. And so I run a little container and I share the, uh, the, the image in with the container um, and so, and, and via volume. And that packager unpacks it into a transport volume. So that's the entire purpose of it. We could very easily extend it to just take whatever path is there and make it available via volume. And so in this case, you could point it at, you know, any, any bind mountable path on the, on the running virtual machine. The caveat is that you actually Whenever you're t talking about running virtual machine, you have to install the tool and Docker on the running virtual machine. Right. And so, be, like, I wanted to avoid, hey, we, we have Docker, we're detecting Docker. Um, you're mutating the thing that you're inspecting in right. that case. So I wanted to avoid that first, which is why we targeted the VMDK uh, for our initial release. Yeah, and so, and so that's how the Windows one started. Uh, you can, but, but then we actually extended it because we realized that we as long as we could connect to a remote file system on a running machine, then we could get all the information we needed. So you can, with the Windows one, you can run it on a, on a static uh, virtual machine disk. You can run it on the machine itself, but as Jeff said, then you need to install the tool on the machine, which ain't great. Uh, or you can, you can share a network path and then run the tool against the network path. Awesome, thanks. Thanks. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, great talk, by the way. Um, so on the detection side, do you sequence the detectors in any way? Um, so do you first discover no. it? Okay. So no. it's a the detectors, so the te at least on the Linux side, the detectives all run in parallel. They should be very, very 
short-lived processes, very lightweight. You're just doing file detection. Um, in some cases, you might do a little bit of generation. Like in the, in the case of where I was in, in, inspecting the installed packages, I had to go off and get a list of packages. Then I had to do some set off magic in order to chop it up, make sure I got just the pieces that I wanted to, and then write them the standard out. But the detectives have read-only access to the shared thing, to, to the shared material, um, the shared initial disk. So they can't compete or mutate or conflict with each other as far as what they're accessing. And also, they, they're, they're contributing um, parallel output streams. And so it's really up to the workflow, the workflow engine to take all those things, figure out which provisioners need to run, and then hand those streams off to the provisioners. And so really there's, there's no crosstalk or anything like that um, going on, but they do run in parallel. Okay. And if you're thinking about um, dependency within, within, a, within a detective, like, so I know Apache's there, and the next thing I need to detect is where's all the stuff. Well, really, that, that's going to be one detective. Or certainly in the Windows or, side, or, or our detectives yeah. are big. Yeah. Oh, I was more thinking in case of, um, let's say, I discover it's Ubuntu, mm -hmm. and then I discover Apache. How would I know to extract Apache for Ubuntu versus, let's say, an RPM installed Apache? Right. So. I really wanted the detectives to be as specific as possible. So in this case, I have, um, I have for init is a good is a good example. Um, I have a an Apache detective that detects um, the Apache SysV configuration files. Or if you somehow find like a, a system D configuration or service definition or unit definition for Apache, you could look for that there. But the whole point is. If we write these things as simple as possible, then we run them in parallel, and then if everything works correctly and it validates, then only one of them would have triggered. Okay, right? so I should have separate detectors. Yeah, for Apache like on Ubuntu, the, Apache on. Something. Right. The 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 app get one that I showed is a little bit of a it was a compromise there yeah. because I had to balance between do I want to write a billion detectives and a billion provisioners. Or do I, I have got this one really good file and this one really good point that I could say get a whole bunch of things on the system. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that those, the, the order that they're contributed um, makes it so that all of that stuff would happen early in the Docker file creation. Um, and then if there's any specific configuration, like most of the time configuration on Linux is gonna live somewhere in, in the Etsy directory, right? And, and despite how you install Apache or whatever, usually, the config file is still in that one place. And so I thought, okay, that's a good target. We can actually say, is there an Etsy uh, Apache or HTTPD conf, right? And if there is, we can do things like inspect it, do all these other things. So um, there was uh, targeted. I, I would prefer, I think it, it would be a better design to see them very, very targeted, a very fine tooth comb to run through the file system and figure out which pins hit something and then just run those few provisioners. So if you saw in, in the output, it was like a whole huge chunk of detectives that run, and then like four or five provisioners run. Um, you know, you could, you, could, you could do a whole lot with that. You. So. Thanks. Yep. So I just wanted to tell you, first of all, that you already have a pull request waiting now for okay. fixing that 16.0. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Probably the smallest pull request I've ever made. <laughs> uh, so I, when I first started with Docker, I made a bad assumption that Docker was somewhere saving my Docker files as I was making all my images. And so I didn't keep my Docker files around. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you think it would be reasonable to run this tool against my existing Docker containers and see if it will reverse engineer for me the Docker file that I used to create that Docker container. Well, you'd end up with you'd end up with a very ugly Docker file, first and foremost, right? Because, because of how um, uh, low resolution is the wrong word, but be because of, of the, we have to guess at everything, right? We have to try to anticipate as many things as we can, and so there's a whole lot of things that we can't finesse. Um, you, you might end up with a good functional equivalent um, it would probably be way bigger than it needs to be. But it would um, at least be a good starting point, maybe, for... Maybe it would be a good starting point. The real challenge, though, would be getting into, um, at least in my case, you, you, it doesn't, these don't run against Docker images, 
right? Docker images are basically just tar files. Right. And so very, you, you could do something like extract it and blow it up and then slap it into a disk location, but at the level of effort that you're going through there, I don't know, it, it would be a good extension point okay. for sure. That, and if you are interested in that, the component in, in the Linux side is called a packager. Um, so that would be what you're looking for. All right, thank you. All right. Good luck. <laughs> right, no, I mean, seriously, that's, <laughs> that would be a task. Yeah, Anything this else? Is, this is kind of embarrassing, but uh, th is this tool useful against bare metal? I have uh, a couple servers that are still running stuff on bare metal and would like to potentially containerize some of them. Uh, the Windows tool, are you talking Windows or Linux? In Linux. Oh, okay, in that case. Uh, the Windows tool runs on, can, can run on it as long as you have uh, access to remote running disk, or, or um, I guess, can you run it on the active disk? Uh, you can, if, if you've got a machine, whether it's VM or, or, or bare metal, you can run the tool on it or you can run it remotely and, and get access, so yeah. So it's not your question, but if you had asked about Windows, the answer would be yes. <laughs> the answer on Linux is if you extend it. Um, like, there's, there's really nothing special about the workflow. It's really that packager component that would say whether or not I am using Guestfish to explode a virtual machine disk or if I'm actually doing a bind mount to something on the host, or if I'm doing a SCP from a remote location, right? Like that's a definite possibility. If you just copy the whole file system over, you can expect it, inspect it locally. Um, there's a whole number of things you could do. Today, it's not gonna be something that you can do out of the box, but should be a good extension. Okay, so. yeah, I know Oracle makes a P2V tool. I was trying to think of ways to avoid using that. Yeah. But I guess that's an option as well. Yep. Well, you could P to V and then V to C. P to V, that, that's what I meant, P to V. Thank you. You can also uh, use a tool that, um, that actually just captures the file system and creates a VMDK. Um, just monolithic, flat VMDK, nothing fancy. I'll give so, it a try. So that would work. Go ahead. Um, can it detect uh, third-party components um, that just say like Oracle client that's been installed on that VM? Linux or Windows? Uh, Windows. Oh. Actually for both too. Cause... Well, so yes, in your case, as long as it's been installed through the package manager, yeah? Yeah, then... today if you install something through package manager, we'll get it. Okay. Um... Uh, in the Windows one, we... We have got an artifact that will go and, and inspect the registry for installed features, uh, installed Windows features, and another one that will do installed software, but uh, I'm not 100% certain on that, uh, to be honest, because the trouble is, in order to do that properly, we would really need to, to, to get down to the MSI level. If you've installed an MSI, then there are sufficient artifacts on the machine that we could scoop up and try to recreate it. But that, that's, that's a level of complexity that we haven't actually kind of got to yet. So if it's an executable, it's not going to work? If it's, if it's, it depends where it is. So at the moment, there's nothing that says, oh, I've got, I've got some stuff. I've got a folder here. I want that brought out. There's not an artifact as simple as that, but that would be super simple to write. Yeah, but it's, if it's, a, it's, if in it's a folder, but then there's a number of things in the registry. Exactly. So then we would need to understand how it got how it was provisioned and be able to replicate that. And unless it was done through MSI, you could have done anything to do that. We have no way of knowing the relationship between it. Unless you get down to the level of writing really specific uh, detectives, we call them uh, discovery artifacts or something in Windows, uh, then you could do that. But then you'd have a detective that says, okay, I'm looking for Oracle client uh, 1210, so I, I go here for the install, unless someone's installed it in a different folder when they did it, and then I need these reg keys and this and that and the other. So um, unless you've got something really clear, it's, it would be hard. MSIs would be, would be, would be less hard. <laughs> okay. okay, so the best case scenario is to run the tool after um, you look at the Docker file and then you add the command to install the component. Yeah, well, one of the great things about this is that particularly the Windows tool, we've been using it with clients who are doing proof of concepts to move their Windows stuff to, to Docker images. And one of the great things about it is uh, you run your tool against your VM or against your disk, you get a Docker file, you build it, you run the image. In the case of a .NET website, you go and browse to it and you get a massive error. 
But that massive error is your application space. It's the world that you understand. So it will say, I'm missing this dependency, and then you can go and add it. So for you, when you, when you hit the problem, you're not in a world of Docker or in a world of virtual machine, you're in a world of your application. You, you've got a, you're in a better place to fix it than, than we are writing a generic tool. Thank you. No uh, my question is, can you extract cron jobs? Mm. to uh, image that's and a good how well does cron d run inside the container well i haven't run it <laughs> but uh i i'm pretty sure yeah it, have you run it with with run it So yeah, I mean the cron daemon I, I mean i've seen it there there is several good base images that actually include cron inside um Oh yeah, that's a good example. So actually, yeah, I've seen cron run inside of containers just fine, and I've seen it actually run with the run it init process just fine. But um, then you're in the world of a, of, a, of a paradigm shift, aren't you? So actually, do you want something running in cron in a container, or do you want some cron job creating containers? Well, let's talk, I mean, this is not best practices. We're in this really raw world, right? Like. If they have a, we're in, we're in uh, escape from VM mode. Um, so if they have a cron and they have a critical cron job that, that is running in a VM and they want to do that in a container, you could do it. You'd have to write a, a provisioner for it. Um, and you'd have to write, uh, you'd have to write two provisioners. You'd have to want, write one that actually gets the configuration for your cron jobs. I didn't do that. It wasn't on our MVP. And you'd have to write a, an init provisioner that actually makes sure to start cron. But there's examples of both of those in there with Apache. So have at it. I'd love to see it. So I could imagine many times when you lift and shift your applications, even though they might live in Apache or whatever, they would have references maybe to special folders on the file system or something like that. Absolutely. So do you have um, detectives, I guess, that you can parameterize and say, take my Apache, but also take the opt folder or yes. var, whatever. So it, at least in the Linux tool, um, I have a couple different Apache specific detectives. One detects the, the Apache configuration um, and lifts and shifts that. The other one detects that Apache is there, and that's part of the, the apt detective and provisioner pair. And then I have another one that, te that, that lifts and shifts specifically the Apache doc root, right? So this is a case where that detective actually inspects the Apache configuration file, figures out where the doc root is, and then lifts and shifts that. So what if I just, I, I mean, if I had a, a series of VMs and I knew that in all of these VMs in var slash data or var slash uh, foobar, mm -hmm. that's where there are some downloadable files or whatever that are hosted through Apache somehow. Um, but not necessarily mentioned in a, in a config file, right? Yep. I mean, that could be in PHP file or whatever. Th this would be the simplest uh, provision, uh, detective provisioner pair you'd write, because the, it right. what it would do is... What I have to write it myself, that's what I'm... Today you'd have to write it yourself, because okay, okay. I haven't written it. But, it. but there are a couple that are very similar to that, and all it would be is a... You'd, you'd probably, the command for your Docker file in the provisioner would probably be um, tar. Right. <laughs> It would just tar the directory, yeah. right? Because it, it actually lifts the files and hands it off. It would tar and stream the output to standard out, and the provisioner would stream it in, and then uh, and then actually just stream it back out. So but then the detectives are no longer like these general purpose things. I mean, I wouldn't contribute that thing back. I'd have to maintain. No, it no. I mean, or... you, you could you could absolutely do that. Right, because it wouldn't hurt to run that detective on a machine that doesn't have it. I mean, we're we're not yeah. we're, we're we're not. Um, the, the whole oh, point is it's a filter, right? And so it would it just wouldn't do anything. All right, thank you. You're very welcome. Anything oh. else? One more. We one more. One more. <laughs> we got one more question. All right. So where do you, where do you see this being used? Because like, if I want to have some uh, application running in container. I would probably, you know, install or create a Docker file. Yeah, please. Instead of trying to re reverse engineer this. So do you see actually this being used in at least staging or test development? So I think it's a, 
a lot of effort going into it, but that yeah. nobody uses. No, so it, I feel that way. I there, there, there's, thanks. There's, thanks for very confidence. Right? <laughs> Remember no, you. there's, and I had the same questions, right? I mean, I'm a Docker captain. I write Docker files all day. I help people write Docker files. I write books about teaching people how to write Docker files. Yeah. Um, and so that was a real question, but it's, it's really difficult to understand the variety and the spectrum of perspectives that are out there. Um, there are a lot of people who, who encounter other people who say, hey, I, I can't justify getting out of this virtual machine setup that I have. I don't even know what it would look like. Would it even run? That whole thing. And rather than like that person going up to, coming in and working with these people to say, well, tell me everything about your app so that I can dockerize it for you, which wouldn't scale. Um, this gives them a really rapid way to prototype. Right, and, so. and your scale point is really good too. So this is a tool which you can automate. So one of on the Windows side, one of the people who are who are doing this as part of a POC, they've set up a bunch of scripts that that run first and then call image to Docker, and they are running it on a thousand VMs. So they know that their the way their VMs is set up is in such a way that uh, the image to Docker can extract a good start of a ten Docker file from them. Bang. So if you're a consultant, you've lost. A chunk of time building the Docker files for them, but that scales. It's a tool. Yeah. So it's not for everybody. And really, I mean, I'd rather just everyone learn how to containerize their apps, right? Um, but it's not for everybody. Like, every there's a whole wide range uh, to the learning curve, right? To the migration story. And for some people that are on one end of it, they just want to kick the tires before they commit to learning or investing or doing any of that other kind of stuff. So, But if you know how to do it, and you know what you're running, and write the Docker file. All right, uh, that was an awesome, awesome talk. Thanks for the q and I know it was a little extended, but I think we all appreciate you guys answering questions. Uh, up next, we have a security talk by a couple of Docker engineers. But please give it up for these two here. They did an amazing job. Thanks. Thank you, Jamin.